So thank you to everyone for coming today and thank you to our speakers. So this is part of our Practical Technologies webinar series where we're looking at different technologies around synthetic biology and the intersection of biology and engineering. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from our two speakers, uh, Dr. Ryman Hashem and Dr. Thomas George Thurafel about soft robotics. Uh, so we'll get on with the first of our talks. So I think Thomas is going to talk first. Uh, just to introduce him, Thomas George Thurafel studied for his degree at the Indian Institute of Technology in Hyderabad, followed by a master's degree in biorobotics from Waseda University in Tokyo and a PhD in biorobotics from the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa, Italy. He's currently a research associate in the Bioinspired Robotics Lab in Cambridge, and today hopefully he's going to tell us a bit about soft robotics and what they are uh, so we can get a nice overview. And over to you, Thomas. Thank you, Stephanie. Right. Uh, so I'll give a brief overview of what is soft robotics because I think that most of the audience here are not from an engineering background. So it's mostly just videos and stuff from other groups. I'll have a short inter interaction to what we do in our lab in Cambridge, but it's mostly work from other fields and how and why this field is interesting to us. Uh, start with a brief history lesson. So uh, this is a work done 15 years ago. Uh, actually not a work in per se, it's a video showing how a very old robot uh, can do a lot of things, a uh, lot of difficult tasks inside a house, uh, which is used as a, an example of why uh, we need uh, to improve the brains of a robot. So here, the robot itself is very simple, but it's actually totally operated by a human being. And so this robot is actually used in an argument that our robots are sufficient enough to do all these tasks, but our, the brains of the robots are not complex enough to do these tasks. Uh, 15 years has gone past, but still we don't have robots that can do these tasks in an autonomous way. So we can do it tele by teleoperation by human user, but still we don't have robots that can do this. Uh, now, recently, there have been also similar works on using learning for doing these kind of tasks. And here again, uh, they show that, all uh, right, uh, so they show that machine learning based techniques can, can help in solving these problems. Again, the argument is the brain of the robots are not good enough, but learning based techniques can help solve these issues of control tasks in, in robots and hopefully bring them closer to our, inside our homes. So that's one side of the argument. So the second side of the argument is that uh, it comes from nature. So here I have two examples, really cool examples. One is from plant science itself of a seed that actually burrows itself inside soil. And it has a very simple, uh, it doesn't have any brain, but it has a very simple adaptive mechanism to make sure it's able to burrow itself. So it has this nice morphology, uh, which helps it, first of all, to be able to apply forces. It also has some kind of feedback. So once it realizes that it's not able to burrow itself deep in, in, in inside the soil further, it if you look at the video, uh, at some point, it's going to start unwinding itself again so that it's, it comes to a better footing so that it can burrow itself again. And all this is done without a brain uh, or a traditional brain that we define in in, in nature or in computers, right? So there's no, uh, there's no real electronic, there's not an electronic brain or an, uh, yeah, uh, for performing this task. It's all done through chemical reactions. Another example, which is quite often used in software is, is this, this old video of a fish flowing, uh, swimming against a flow of water. And what's remarkable about this fish is that um, it's actually a dead fish. And this fish is actually flowing against the flow of water just because of how the body is designed. So this argument from nature says that, okay, uh, maybe the brains are not what we should focus on, but on the body itself, because uh, in nature, the, our body itself is op so optimized that we don't need a complex brain to do these kind of complex behaviors. Um, it's still an argument. There's no good answer to, there's no good solution to, or there's no uh, theoretical evidence to say that one is better over the other. But from where we come from, uh, that is soft robotics, we believe that, okay, 
in a video which is more important we should first focus on the body itself because that's that's the intermediate that's the medium through which information flows through and out from the body so if you get all your sensory system is uh, is able to take information from the environment and whatever the brain does there's you need the body to act on what the the brain tells you to do so irrespective of how complex your brain is if you don't have the right body you won't be able to do the task that you want and and consequently you won't get intelligent behavior and that's essentially where the soft word is comes in um, there are some key uh, points that you should uh, uh, that that is common to all soft robotic elements i think uh, one is of course that's made out of stretchable materials soft materials uh, that is probably the most important keystone of soft robotics they are also usually characterized by large number of passive degrees of freedom which means that most of its behavior is is purely passive it's not controlled by the muscles of the actuators and they try to encode uh, logic or let's say computation in the body itself uh, rather than using the brain or an electronic uh, circuit and there are reasons to that do that i won't really go into details of that uh and th that also means that a lot of the information it gathers is through interaction so through the physical body not through external senses uh and also uh, which eventually leads to using a lot of smart materials i'll give you some examples of these now so that it becomes more clear so there's an example on the left side of how we would traditionally do grasping of an object robotic grasping so you use a camera uh you use a depth camera so you use uh, uh, a four x uh, four degree of freedom camera uh, look at it use usually use machine learning techniques to predict the shape of the object and also then plan accordingly where you should pick up the object so that the grasp is stable uh, this is very computational intensive like before the advent of machine learning techniques deep learning techniques uh, it was very difficult to grasp an object even now with these devices it's very difficult uh what on the right hand i'll show an ex a different example which uses soft robotic technologies to do the same task uh the only difference here uh, this is, you still need some sort of a sensing element but it's very primitive so in order to grasp an object all you need to know is roughly the position of the object and uh the height of the object and how this works is a, a balloon which is filled with coffee grounds uh and it's uh, so and in the beginning it's very soft and deformable so when it when it touches the object it deforms to the shape of the objects and then once it has touched the object what we do is something called jamming where you suck out the air inside the balloon and it becomes completely rigid so and this allows it to have a firm grasp on the object uh, this means that you can do grasping of any type of objects very easily without any uh, the sensing component becomes very simple so the same task you're able to do with very simple controllers uh, uh, essentially the body takes care of a lot of the computation that is done by the camera before and you can clearly see that because the shape the information of the object is kind of encoded inside the body right by when it when it does its passive interaction that's how we get this deformation and it kind of uh, encodes the shape of the body inside the inside this granular material so they have shown beautiful examples of how this can be used for grasping any type of object even for very delicate objects which is again very difficult for traditional robots especially if you don't have any information of soft uh, of the forces that you are applying another example uh, which is from a group in in germany is how you can encode information inside the body itself so here they have made tiny micro robots and they are not really robots in most sense because there's no brain there's no control there's no sensors there's no actuator just a pure material which can actually just bend and move around and swim in water carry objects or um, and it's able to do all this just by very simple principle which is uh, so it has a magnet it's, it's a soft material which has magnetic particles inside and then you can magnetize this particle through a, a strong magnetic field and what how they do it is by they they, they bend this material and then they apply a magnetic field so that uh the magnetic field is stable in this bent configuration but elastically the material is stable in the straight configuration so when you apply a external magnetic field a uniform magnetic field this object will bend and that you can and if you apply it in the opposite direction it will bend in another direction and all this information is enough to control this tiny robot through uh 
remotely and also be able to do a lot of clever behavior. Um, and it has incredible amount of application. But then again, uh, it's very simple. Uh, the basic principle is encoding some sort of information in the structure itself. Right. Another example of, of mechanical logic is, is this work here from Bristol, where they use uh, purely fluidic circuits to encode logic gates. So for example, uh, typical logic gates are like AND gates or gates that you see in electronics. Using, they, they use something like uh, transistors to do that. We can do the same thing using mechanical components. And that's, this is one example of that. Uh, similar, and that uh, this is was used to move, drive a software word in an oscillatory manner using simple conducting fluids uh, with uh, and non conducting fluids. So, so it's an example of how we can make a, a, a gate here, logic gate. Similar principles being used on the example here, where they make a robot which is uh, made of no electronic components, purely mechanical components. And how the logic is again implemented, implemented is through material properties of a, of a nonlinear uh, elastomer. So elastomers have nonlinear properties which can be exploited to make it switch from different states, essentially. And that allows you to design robots which do not have any electronic components, and which means they can be deployed in various scenarios where where um, electronic components components might get damaged. For example, in like uh, a nuclear, like uh, where you have nuclear hazard and stuff like that. Uh, finally, uh, I'll briefly go through smart materials. So the 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 biggest revolution that came from software world is is the rise of a lot of smart materials uh, because you wanted that because you have a constraint of being stretchable, uh, being soft. Uh, soft and that means that you had to come up with new ways to actuate these robots also sense these robots using new materials and that led to a lot of new materials coming out in the recent few years i'll just go through quickly go through some of these examples this one is an actuator made from actual muscles i think i believe it's from insect muscles uh, and that's used to ro drive a robot here uh, and there again, um, it's really cool and it's, it looks very promising in application because these muscles can actually stay alive for a long time and they're also in the end biodegradable. Uh, and you essentially get the same efficiency as actual muscles, right? Uh, they're soft, they're uh, as efficient as the actual muscle. There's another example of, of how novel actuators have come about. Here is an example of a of soft pump, which uses, uh, which is essentially uh, two electrodes uh, have a with an electrolyte in between. I mean, you apply high voltage between this uh, two electrodes, this electrolyte will flow across uh, the electrodes. And because you want it to be stretchable, it, uh, this also means that you don't have any moving parts in this, in this pump, uh, which means it's also completely silent. So this constraint of being stretchable has eventually led to a, a, a really cool pump without any moving parts and which is completely silent and can be miniaturized uh, to any extent that you want. Another example is that the rise in soft sensing. Uh, here, we don't really see the sensors, but they are essentially strain sensors. When you apply some strain across these sensors, the rest of these sensors would change and that can be used as sensors in soft robots. And there are a lot of examples of sensors and I'll show you some examples from our lab later. And finally, I'll just quickly go through uh, some advances in, in power sources also. So this is a fish which is driven by um, essentially a soft battery. Uh, and there's nothing much to see here, but it's, it's driven by a battery which, uh, which is completely deformable. Um, and they have used it in, in a robot, but that is actually of relevance to even other fields like in, in mobile technology or in, or in uh, yeah, flexible electronics. Uh, so I'll just quickly go through what we are doing in the, our lab in Bioinspired Robotics Lab in Cambridge, uh, and we are supervised by Professor Fumia Yida. I'll show some of the work that we do, and Raiman later will show something very specific uh, and in more detail to kind of make you understand what are the application scenarios. Uh, we'll work a lot with smart materials. So one of the projects that we are uh, collaborating with partners from Europe is uh, this project called Shero, where we are trying to make soft robots out of self-healing materials. Uh, we have an example here. These can be tuned to be self-healing at room temperature or 
uh, pi action leading. It's an example of what uh, this material looks like. So this one is self-filling at room temperature and instantaneously, as you can show here. It's an old video, as so you know, it's from 2020. <laughs> and, uh, and we can use these materials to make really clever uh, devices. So an example here in the bottom is a sensor made out of this, not the same material, but similar material. So it's just a air cavity is surrounded by this self healing material and you use uh, a tube to measure the pressure inside these cavities. Uh, so that can act as a force sensor and but this can be damaged also without uh, uh, without uh, losing functionality and it will instantaneously heal. And now we are using these time and we are miniaturizing these sensors so that we can actually use them as pain sensors or damage sensors in robots, which is uh, something that's never been done before because uh, unless you have a self feeling property, uh, none of these sensors would be repeatable or reusable. So this allows you to do continuous pain sensing uh, uh, throughout the lifetime of a robot. Also working with hydrogels uh, to make novel soft uh, robots. Here's an example from one of our VHGLs where he's using glycerol, uh, gelatin-based hydrogels to make soft sensors and also the body of a soft robot. So they have really, really nice properties that they are only responding, responsive to strain, uh, whereas any change apply, application of pressure does not change the sensor properties. So which is uh, really useful for strain sensing applications. And we also made devices so that you can 3D print these um, materials onto any surfaces. So it can be 3D printed on the robot or also onto gloves for wearable devices. Um, yeah, and they are very nice sensor properties, uh, which makes them really uh, appealing for software bodies. Not only that, because they, they have these, um, some of these hydrogels have self healing properties. So these simple, if we can make a simple software board out of these hydrogels and damage them and keep them at room temperature for some time, and then you can actually get self healing behavior just because of uh, the hydrogen bonds inside uh, these materials. Uh, I have one thing to note is like it can actually speed up the self healing process by applying some water uh, or heating it a bit. And in this case, after one hour, it doesn't fully self heal, but yeah, you can just heat it to get full self healing properties. Uh, we also do a lot of self sensing and control, like I mentioned before. So we use these new soft sensors. So here we have an anthropomorphic finger with sensors embedded inside them. And these are again strain sensors, so which means that once you apply a strain to them, their electrical properties would change. And then you can measure that change in electrical properties to measure either deformation of the body or the, or the forces you apply. Uh, in this example, we are using it to predict, predict the forces that is being applied and then control the forces that it's, uh, it's receiving so that you can maintain the forces it applies. Uh, uh, we are very much interested in controlling complex dynamical systems. Uh, an example is uh, one here. This is not exactly soft robotics, but it is very similar to the challenges that we face in software, where you have a very uh, passive body, which has complex dynamics and uh, is uh, not fully controllable. Um, and uh, so the task here is controlling an object which is floating in water by, by remotely uh, oscillating on the surface of the water. Uh, so the idea is to generate surface flow so that you can move this object around. It's very difficult to be modeled mathematically. So we use uh, new techniques in reinforcement learning or machine learning to figure out how to move these objects around uh, by trial and error. Uh, so this is an example of uh, how we can do that. So here we are trying to get the, this tiny object to the edge of the, of, the, of the box, but also at a particular angle. So we wanted to move it, let's say 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Uh, how do you move it? So how, how do you, uh, disturb the water surface so that you can move. Um, again, this is not soft robotics, but it includes the same uh, ideas and principles. Finally, I'll just show uh, some work from uh, one of an, another PhD student who works on designing anthropomorphic hands. So he's interested in knowing what is the best passive design of, of an arm which will allow us to do grasping. So, so his way to, to think of this problem is to design the best uh, hand possible, but without any actuator. And look at the more, what kind of passive properties you need in order to be, uh, in order to perform all these grasping manipulation tasks without uh, 
the need of sensing or actuation. Uh, and this is some of his work. So he's trying to, uh, or the only thing is controlling is how the, the base of the arm moves. And then without any kind of actuation in between, uh, trying to figure out how to pick something up, just using the passive interaction between the body and the objects. So he's able to do all these, picking up different objects of different sizes and stuff without any real uh, changes, any real actuation in between. Uh, so the, the hand is always passive from beginning to end and he's able to do different type of graphs without uh, changing uh, yeah, uh, the actuation. All right. So that was all from my side. Uh, I've, I'll take questions towards the end and I'll give the floor to Ryman who'll talk about uh, something more specific in software robotics. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Thomas. Um, that was really interesting. I'm looking forward to the questions. Um, so just to introduce our second speaker today is Ryman Hashem. Uh, Ryman has completed his master's and PhD at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, and he joined the Bio-Inspired Robotics Lab um, alongside uh, Thomas uh, with Professor Fima Ilda in Department of Engineering last year. And I think uh, Ryman is going to talk about a um, stomach simulator, and I will pass on to you, Ryman. Um, thank you very much. Um, I really uh, uh, appreciate that you guys invited me. and. Um, very happy to uh, have this uh, short talk and uh, it's very interesting to see the synthetic biology and how they are actually um, <clears throat> uh, ba uh, based on, on, on uh, biological uh, backgrounds while I think we both as a soft robotics and biology going to the same direction but we have a different background so we definitely need some connection there. Um, we all the time uh, trying to understand some of the biological behavior and so on. Definitely someone study that would be more helpful than um, just thinking everything uh, behave like a robot. Cool, thank you very much. So um, yeah, um, how I get started. So basically uh, um, Thomas started to introduce the soft robotics in general and um, some of the examples and um, how it's actually based um, as a robotist and we started uh, engineering uh, mechanical mechatronics or so on and we trying to sneak in and understand some of the biological behaviors and uh, from our own understanding is always different but um, this uh, presentation is more or less uh, it's about an example um, about how um, that's uh, we could uh, look to the biological system, for example, um, uh, our own organs, um, the human organs, and uh, understanding the fundamental and principles of the stomach and how to uh, build a robot that could simulate the behavior of the uh, stomach. Um, so it will be a brief introduction um, to the uh, to the, 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 the stomach robots, and I hope it uh, will make sense. Um, so just uh, as what uh, Thomas introduced um, in, the, um, in the soft robotics and so on as well, I wanted to link it to the stomach as well. Um, so for example, as, as I started with the stomach, how, why, for example, we needed a stomach and, and uh, is there an existing current stomach, for example? So in general, what the stomach robots, it's is, uh, simulating the stomach, either the chemical or the physical digestion process. So the chemical is the static uh, of uh, breaking down the, uh, the food by the juices of the stomach um, and the enzymes. Um, and that can be in vitro and in the tubes and so on. But what we were more interested in as a robotics is how to simulate the physical behavior or pristaltic wave. Um, if, if you study the stomach, uh, which is a series of contractions, uh, which I will show later. Um, so this is a model of like a state of the art dynamical model, um, and that's very rigid. So basically there is, let's say the food um, button here, and there's like cylinder that pushes the food and break it down. And there are some uh, tubes that pushes some of the ke uh, chemical part. Um, 
just to simulate how the food breaks inside. And this is very interesting, especially for food technology or food scientists. Um, if they want to develop new food or for some patients, they were they wanted to see how the food can break uh, faster and so on, or new medicines, for example, all the reactions of that. Um, so we wanted to simulate it properly, right? So this is not realistic a model. So what we wanted is uh, getting closer a step to how we could uh, actually have a stomach and we could look like, um, behave like a stomach. So it would be, the simulation would be better basically in that sense. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to move from rigid materials, rigid robots uh, to a softer material. And that's what soft, the whole soft robotics is about. Um, but it's still, it's, it's not that easy. It's a still biological body and so on. Um, however, we could manage to do a little bit of a step ahead rather than doing the classical one. Um, one of the problem is the simulation and the, and, uh, and the uh, uh, psychology, uh, physiological dig uh, digestive process is like how, what's the process of the food? Uh, and as soon as we start at the food and the content of the stomach, as soon as it gets inside the stomach, what happened inside? And how many stages it happens until the um, until the uh, digestive or, or the food breaks down, which is called the chyme, uh, and then that will be emptied to the intestine after that. Um, not going too much to the soft robotics uh, to have a really great examples, but yes, it's it's kind of similar to what you guys are doing. It's uh, kind of very recent um uh, like literally formed recently maybe uh, in 2010 it gets uh, it got really more and more popular of course it started 20 years ago but it wasn't formed it wasn't something called soft robotics it's always um, referred to different things but it's also it's multidisciplinary uh, and uh, got all the um, different type of fields um, for example, the robotics, a uh, robotics, uh, little bit of medical uh, research and, and, and so on. Um, so uh, it is very, I think it's really um, interested to link, uh, I'm very as well interested to link both um, fields uh, in some way um, with some um, <clears throat> uh, projects uh, or, or, or building robots uh, and so on for um, simulating some the biological behavior. So what is the areas involved in the stomach? So there are three uh, main areas that, um, of course, it was challenging uh, for a background like me. It's like medical, uh, jumped in straight away to how at least the basic anatomy of the stomach. Um, food technology that they really interested on in those robots. So they did build uh, a few of them um, and they kind of uh, behave as the state of the art of this uh, uh, device. So um, that was really uh, good to look at. And then the engineering bit where we applied for the soft robots. Why we need it, what kind of applications. Um, so I got three examples of why we need a stomach robot as a simulation. Um, not to convince it with an implant. Um, an implant would be an amazing idea and it definitely would uh, work toward that. But currently it's very, very challenging to do that. The material are there, but how to control it inside a body if we want to implant. So it is a, simu a, a test environment. It's a, it's, it's a simulation model. Uh, for testing um, um, for biologists, uh, doctors, uh, for teaching purposes, and so on. Uh, for example, um, I was uh, my my work was with the Biomedical Institute, uh, Auckland Biomedical Institute, where they study the peristaltic wave. Um, so this is the peristaltic wave, which is starts. Um, so it was a very quick i'll just play it again so it start from here and then move to uh, the end uh, it has a rhythmic behavior it's called the anti-contraction wave and there are people have got some illnesses with it where the rhythmic behavior wasn't as as similar so they found out as the similar with the heart diseases the stomach got the same thing and they needed a pacemaker for it so they developed a pacemaker and so on. So all these new uh, found uh, illnesses and, and, and the trying to solve it within new developed devices, we needed a test environment. This is a simulation, which is a great 
but basically they wanted a model to test all these uh, devices that we have and maybe if we apply if we abstracted the signals from an uh, ill uh, patient then we might apply it to the robots and see how we can fix this um, arithmetic, uh, arithmetic or dysrhythmia that's one of the diseases that could, could have this stomach um the, similar to the um the other application which is this is one of the companies that designing the um for the medical studies which is a pell cam so rather than have the endoscopic the classical one with wires and um in certain um, invasive kind of um, way for testing the organs the esophagus or stomach or intestine um, there are a big uh, trend to build those little capsules that they got the cameras and you just swallow them and they they have a wi-fi to just uh, have the cameras so this is it definitely needed this environment to see how these capsules would behave inside a a stomach that uh, contracts and moves. It's just a dynamic environment. So how we can test it that right now they've tested it in the static uh, stomachs. It's just a model of a plastic model of a static stomach that doesn't move. Um, of course, the stomach doesn't work all the time, but as soon as you fill it with food and water, it will start, it will start the peristaltic wave. So that's another application and also for technologies for new drugs and new foods. Um, so yeah, uh, basic. Um, the anatomy that's how to um, start it with the project um, how, what is the anatomy of the stomach is how many section it is um, how medical uh, doctors describe it so we could build a, the first thing which is the model um, so they got like fundus body and the antrum these are three sections of the stomach um, that's the major part of the body. Uh, the second thing is the geometry. There are no exact geometries. The, the, the minimum could be 0 0.3 uh, milliliters, goes up to four liters, depends on uh, the, the different variety. But there are, let's say, an average of one liter after a normal meal. Um, so try to develop a model with this, uh, uh, with this um, volume. Um, and the this this the shape and size as well it's uh, it's uh, varies but this is uh, abstracted from a CT image it's from a patient um, so trying to model a similar exact model of of one of the stomachs uh, that being abstracted from medical devices uh, so we could have a realistic uh, shape um, within the, the diameter and so on so this is the smallest bit that where the food goes out which is one point one or two uh, centimeters, this is like 11 mil. Um, and it's only allowed the chyme. So it's very, only the liquidy uh, uh, digested food that's allowed to pass. And any, any remain food, it can stay here and keep um, um, breaking down with the juices um, and, and so on. Um, the motility, that's, that's where the challenging part. So only it's uh, two, two types of motility, the, the peristaltic wave, uh, what's it called? Castric pump, um, peristaltic wave, anti-contraction wave. There's a few names to it, um, but this is basically where it started. Started from this bit, um, the the down uh, after the fundus, the upper body. That's where it was started. And there's a called pacemaker here. Started here, ends up to the uh, pylorus gate. Um, and the other one is called the tonic contraction, which is only the top part, the fundus. This bit it doesn't start; it doesn't have the peristaltic wave, but it has a, it's like a massaging uh, kind of contraction. So it's um, that what is it called? Tonic contraction. It, re it basically uh, relax when food's coming in, so it, 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 to give the capacity, to give the size. And, and uh, it pushes a little bit when the stomach is too full. Uh, the stomach is, has a really interesting uh, behavior, which is when it's full, it's not like balloon. When, it, when it's filled, the pressure inside doesn't increase. So basically the muscles keep relaxing and relaxing. And so the food inside doesn't have, it doesn't influence the content of the stomach. So it stays with the same kind of uh, pressure inside. Um, so that's a peristaltic wave. Um, that's the said, it's the pacemaker area. That's the signal, a, it's called EGG signals, uh, like um, 
extracted from the stomach, started from here, it keeps moving down and it's rhythmic and, and three cycles per minute. So one cycle started from pacemaker, ends here about a minute. And there are three, about two to three contraction occurs at the same time. So every, you could divide it in three sections and every 20 seconds there is a wave traveling and it keeps moving, uh, it keeps traveling um, till the end and, and it's in, in a loop uh, until the stomach is empty. This is um, what is inside. It's the biological uh, body. I used to like uh, inform people before, but you guys, I think you 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 don't mind that you studied biological uh, systems. So that's what it's actually an empty stomach, um, um, and that's the peristaltic wave. That's the contraction. It's it's very interesting, very challenging, um, and um, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, it's really uh, that's that's how how hard it was to think of how to build such a muscle. This muscle is only two or three mil uh, thickness, um, and have all these properties and um, and filling with chymes and so on. Um, there are a lot of challenges, of course, but what we wanted to focus on is how to just simulate these contractions, how to have these behaviors. Um, and as you see, it's it started shallow and it increases. Um, it started uh, shallows at the beginning and increases the the contractions uh, until at the end it's almost fully closed. And that's where it started basically the whole idea is pushing the foot down, and the grinding and breaking down foot is down there uh, at the end before uh, uh, before emptying. Um, so moving from the biological body uh, to like how to build this, of course, this is the this is the three actuators led to the stomach. So we have uh, one single actuator and then move to a ring actuator and then make this ring the whole the whole stomach um, model. Um, uh, there are a lot of. Uh, 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 parameters, I would say, or variables, but I was just trying to simplify it to so you could just like why, for example, this model. Um, the first thing to think about is basically not I made the whole stomach as in a 2D and see how we could simulate the wave or the contraction of stomach. I'll go to the second slides, but just to say this is the, ne the next I'm going to talk about these three uh, actuators. Uh, the single actuator. This is kind of similar to that, but let's say we fit five of these linear actuator in a ring shape, and then we fit uh, about twelve ring actuator of these in a whole stomach model. So it's was step by step to to get the whole uh, to have, to get the whole model of the stomach. Um, what I, what technology is? I use the pneumatic system technology, uh, pressurized air. Basically, there are a lot of uh, technologies in soft robotic and so on. Uh, pressurized air was the most suitable for this application because it's uh, generated a larger forces. Um, it is safer to use if I want to fill it with liquids and so on. Um, and um, it, it was uh, it was. Uh, faster to actuate and, and easier to manage. So uh, that's the reason I use the pneumatic system. So the first one, the below actuators, is um, just simplified to three points. What is the concept and then how I model it and then what kind of application. It's not only this, it should be also useful, useful for other stuff, not just the stomach. So as I said, um, a stomach, it just could draw it at a 2D drawing and see how the contractions happening, how travel in 2D lines. And then figure out it's let's say you could simulate it like a sine wave traveling from uh traveling, a traveling sine wave from the pacemaker until the end. And then we will want to measure the peak of this sine wave and the and the width of that. Uh, and how this is how you could simulate it into uh, an actuator. Um, and we don't want the ballooning behavior because if we if we just have a, a a chamber and like a balloon and we fill it with air, it will pressurize in every every direction. So we will not have this shape. We will not have this uh, peak. Um, and that was the very uh, challenge of the the problem and also the large deformation. Um, it's not just flexibility. It's the deformation. It's the stretchability of the material. 
um, and it's, it was very challenging. Even the stretchable material we have still wasn't large enough for that. So it was a bit, uh, these are the two challenges that I faced and um, tried to solve. Um, and then I built the linear actuator um, here with this like a, a, a bellow and then inflated with air, it deformed. And then we have this surface that shape the, and give us this uh, nice shape in the stomach. Um, and then if we fit it in ring actuator, we will have the 3D model of it. Um, model it is because it's soft material. Um, you could model it with a string uh, mass damper system. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but basically it's a spring and viscoelastic as um, is very the one of the fundamental uh, models for uh, for mechanics of uh, robotics and so on, and and viscoelastic material is kind of similar to the spring dam as a system without a mass, of course, but that what it what it what it catches here it catches the something in soft material calls creep response, um, and the creep response if you apply if I apply let's say one set pressure, if I apply 50 kilopascal of pressure here, um, the response will change within time. And that's called creep behavior because the soft material is slow responses and it takes a little bit, a little bit of time to change. It, it did, for this example, it didn't change a lot. However, I still wanted it to uh, do it with viscoelastic. So it, it, capture, it, ca it captures this behavior. So that's what type of modeling it could be used and what can be um, what kind of application? So it's as a soft robotic, it should be more also varies, and it's not only very specific. So it could be fit as a ring actuator. It could be used as a gripper. Um, could be used as a, as a gripper for soft material and so on. And that's how it could sell the point as well. And it's not just um, a stomach. And so uh, have some example. Um, I could show this video quickly. It's just have few few uh, tiny um, materials that, and they all soft materials. Of course, this is another rubber inside. It's just a gripper. You could grip it and put it back for uh, gripping uh, applications for industrial uh, for industrial robotics if you wanted to, um, or for medical uh, robotics as well if you wanted to that because it's entirely soft. It will never affect the objects even if it's sharp and so on. So it will hold it gently. And, 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 and that's the whole idea of uh, building the soft actuators as well. Um, the other one is the ring actuator. So we move from the single one, we wanted to put it together. Um, that was the ring that I built before it was uh, 3D printed, but we wanted the whole entire thing is soft. So, um, and, and had, that's how we did it. This is the whole ring, the whole frame, it's become soft. Um, and simulating uh, gastrointestinal tract um, and wanted to have those type of shapes because the shape is not really smooth. So we have these five and we'll have this indentation uh, or what is called gastric fold as well and, and, and inside the stomach. Uh, similar idea, we have the same thing, but put them in, 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 in a ring. The numbers are also calculated. What, how many, how many pillows we needed? It depends on how, how far or how close we wanted to. So this is all calculated uh, mathematically. The modeling here, we didn't want to have go deeper in viscoelastic behavior and so on. So we just truly did the spring and master system. So if we have numbers, we have five pillows here. It means we will have five spring master and the system and we could capture their responses. So we could have a closed loop control if you wanted. A viscoelastic system was harder to use it for closed loop system. So we used the spring mass demo system because we needed the energy of the mass so we could use it for closed loop control. Um, large deformation, that's what I mean. So if you could retract it fully, we have, let's say this is a 50 millimeter diameters. Uh, we can close uh, as far as 80 kilopascal if we have a symmetrical shape, or, or we could have 100. Kilo, uh, we could have 100 uh, percent uh, closed if we have four uh, at 80 percent and one going up to 100 percent. So we could totally close the system. This is just the initial testing for the 
for the ring actuator. That was the first one I did. And um, just to see how the contraction behavior and how soft it is, um, how is it closed? And if I build the whole series of that, would it work in and to generate a pre Celtic wave, for example? Um, there's a lot of nice uh, parameter uh, behavior on these actuators and and so on. And so that's why I kept working on it even after finishing the stomach robots. Um, entirely solved. If one of them blocked, the other one's still working at the same time. Um, and uh, yeah, it could be uh, again used in, in any different application, for example. Um, this is a simulation. I don't know if you guys do uh, doing um, mechanical kind of responses for spring down the system, but we just have to do the simulation so we could use it for control if you want to have series of frame. Uh, this is symmetrical. I just want to show you the asymmetrical one just to show the, uh, the this is a 60%, for example. This is a 100% occlusion. So you got 80% of that and 100% of, uh, of this one actuator. So it's totally fully closed. Um, the last one is the stomach uh, simulator. So we have the conduits. Um, I want to go quick with that. So um, we have this conduit. Uh, that's what the model we designed from the city uh, divided into three sections. The three sections is this proximal antrum, middle antrum, terminal antrum. And those are the section that where the peristaltic wave occur. So the pacemaker and so on. So we divide it into sections so you could control them separately and it makes the whole control make sense. Um, and every section have a different contraction ratio. So um, shallow, uh, uh, deeper, and then 100% of contractions. And we have the gates here opens and close in different sequence. This is the whole conduit inside. And then we apply the ring in outside the, the actuator. So this is the whole stomach, right? This is what looks inside. This is a soft layer inside. The soft layer inside is the shape of this conduit. Um, oh, sorry. And the, this is the frame here is the frame outside and the inside is the silicon of the whole conduit is one uh, of that. And the, all these pillows outside is basically those linear actuators. So they contracted and retracted in sequence so they could generate a uh, peristaltic wave. Um, um, yeah, so this is but just to illustrate those ring, how they sim, uh, generate the Celtic wave in each section uh, simultaneously. Um, this is the whole setup. Uh, I did it in a platform. That's um, why I needed to do that, because we wanted to have an X-ray machine. So when you have X-ray machine, we want all these equipments down there. So we have this is entirely soft. We fill it with barium and we do video video fluoroscopy. Video fluoroscopy is, a, is an X-ray that film videos. So it, because it's an enclosed robot, we can't see inside and that's the problem. So the only way to do it is to do it as the in medical devices, uh, testing in the stomachs and esophagus, filling it, the robots with barium and see how the contraction happens. Um, this is an, a study happened in, in, in Germany back in the day where the they studied the and this biological stomach the and trying to compare the, the three faces the of these stomachs. Are also indicated. So the, um, wave, the gastric the body, the antrum, the gastric pump. and then see how these uh, the peristaltic wave moving and how the chyme inside the, the stomach is emptied slowly one by one. Body and propagate towards the pylorus. Um, so the whole idea is to simulate the three phases of the stomach, which is pushing food, emptying, and return when the non-emptied food and, and, the and, and uh, the break it down. The wave becomes deeper. At the antrum, three parts can be differentiated. A proximal antrum, a middle antrum, and a terminal antrum. When the peristaltic wave moves over the proximal antrum, chyme is propelled into the relaxing terminal antrum. This, therefore, is the propulsion phase. So, During the contraction of the terminal antrum, the pylorus closes. So that's where the second, the, after the emptying, after the emptying and the pylorus open, 
there will be remaining food and then the pillars closes and then it will generate the retro jets that's what's called so when the whole antrum close it will push the remaining food back and that's this is the motion that what breaks the food inside of course with the uh, juices and and um enzyme inside the stomach so that's how simulating the whole behavior um definitely there's a lot of rooms to improve here and wish we have kind of had a, an x-ray to film and and test more and more but we had to, to do the test in the hospital and it was really uh difficult to do that as you know this patient before and after and i just came with the robots and taking time from that uh the clinician so it was um it was nice and funny at the same time, but uh, definitely uh, time constrained with that, but managed to definitely validate and demonstrate how the stomach run. Last slide, last uh, couple of slides. Um, so the stomach robots, they are, they are of course another stomach that we build. Uh, it was different section, lesser actuators and simpler. And we did the same thing. We did the same validation and so on, but it wasn't continuous. Um, the pre-celtic wave wasn't continuous. So uh, we, we did the, stomach, the other stomach that I show. Um, and also there's a long uh, research that way before the stomach, which is the esophagus. And we already actually it's almost become a test environment where uh, I don't know if you heard about the stent uh, uh, for the esophagus, where people have some uh, illness that the esophagus is always uh, contracts. So we needed a stent. So basically, when we they put it in the patient to keep the whole esophagus open, but the stent migrated between the between uh, migrated within time. So they wanted to test how and why. We have the robot to test that. So there's also the esophagus been built, but it used to be simpler the stomach because it's just a, a tube, and that's what the stomach was the the, uh, the the esophagus. But the stomach have this weird shape that makes it really difficult um, to do anything like simulation and so on and move it. And uh, I'm not going to go in detail with this, but the what I wanted to mention here. Is the ring actuator? I used it in this uh, in, in 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 my postdoc at the moment as well. So in hand manipulation. So these finger, we just uh, assume they are finger now. And those uh, by applying pressure, we could move objects. Uh, we could rotate objects. So this is a very niche uh, kind of topic in robotics that uh, in hand manipulation is very challenging because picking itself, it's okay. It's been um, been worked in for years but in hand manipulation is still very very difficult if you think about it and pick any any object around you and move it around your fingers it's very challenging to do with robotics so we're trying to solve like it's an example of in hand manipulation and how we could do it with a very simple actuation we don't want to have a very strong big setup so with by applying the same pressure how we could rotate the object uh right or uh, uh clockwise or counterclockwise and this is we move to concept which is the uh break of symmetry and how we could uh apply a perturbation so we could move the objects left and right and that's what called also something called embodied intelligence which means by one robot you could uh have also multiple functionality without changing the design and actuation and that's something would be very interesting rather than just always uh, design one thing for a specific thing and that's it and won't work with any other things, uh, other other applications. Um, thank you very much. So these are the, the, the last slides. This is the actuators, uh, sing, uh, single actuators, and we have a uh, ring actuator. And what I want to say, like what we can do next is how, we, how could I apply this for other application? What I'm going to use if I have a set uh, layers of these actuator and um, definitely there are a lot of ideas and I'm, I'm very interested to do any collab work or even other application, not just these ring actuator specifically. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm really sorry if I, I take so long. It's fantastic, thank you. Um, so yeah, we'll head into, into Q&A now. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, and I will hand over uh, to Shomanath Bakshi 
um, who is leads the smart microscopy lab in the Department of Engineering here at um, Cambridge and has a background in in both areas, synthetic biology and and also um, robotics and microscopy uh, as well. So, uh, Shramanath, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Uh, maybe I can ask a question to both of you guys, uh, Thomas and Raymond. I was just wondering, like, uh, you know, uh, from me coming from or, or the, the sort of community here in SynBio, uh, who are mostly interested in sort of synthetic biology topics, and there is, as, as Raymond, you pointed out, there is a lot of uh, similarities in the two fields. These are both sort of uh, engineering biology uh, in some sense in different scales. Uh, and uh, while in a lot of synthetic biology, the goal is similar to soft robotics, where we are trying to um, engineer systems with some applications in mind, there is also uh, another area of synthetic biology where we try to validate our understanding of natural systems. And some of the examples that both of you presented, uh, with Thomas, you presented the discussion about how the root was um, uh, trying to sort of use some sort of uh, encoded feedback to make sure that it actually gets into the soil. And Ryman, you were also designing a stomach that could probably help us also to understand the stomach itself. Uh, is, is this something that is being pursued in the field of soft robotics at the moment? Uh, trying to understand the principle of natural biological systems through forward engineering them through soft robotics? Uh, I mean, do you want to go? Uh, so I would just give my quick answer. I think the answer to that is, at least to my understanding, no. I don't think uh, in soft robotics we are trying to do that. I think one of the reasons is it's very difficult to mathematically model these systems, which means you can't really get like first principle models of what is going on. Uh, which means that you can't really understand, uh, you, you probably cannot yeah, uh, formulate the physics of what is going on in nature and then further understand uh, what is going on there, especially once the system gets more complex. But I could be wrong. Uh, Raymond, do you, want, do, you want to, do you think there are examples where this has been done? Um, I'm sorry, but what you mean like simulating the biological system in general or like specific application? Um, yeah, basically testing hypotheses about our understanding of nature um, using sort of rather than computer simulation, using soft robotics as a simulation. Um, so usually not directly. Um, so in that's that's so that's where I think that's exactly where. Uh, it's showing the different, like they are very similar direction, but the the backgrounds where you guys uh, are studying the biological body and more investigating on the biological body itself and how you could replicate those behaviors. Uh, we are more into we use the biological body to get inspired by and and simulated. And when we want to simulate it, uh, for example. It's more uh, from robotist uh, background. It's more for like why we needed this device or what what is the use of it. So it's always uh, related to either application or or study that we needed to invest uh, to find out and then how we could uh, do such a thing. Then we look at it for the stomach itself. It was definitely purposely to to have a model to, to understand. So it, it goes both way. It started as we needed a test environment. We needed a model of a stomach, um, but it comes out, if we actually have such a model, we would even understand more of what is, what is happening inside. And, um, uh, and especially with the illness, it's, uh, it is a big, big gap in, there's a lot of studies on the heart, of course, because uh, we all put a lot of priorities into that. But the stomach, it hasn't been like a lot of studies and recently they more and more discovering new diseases and so on. Um, so, um, and it's going to that direction. So how we could do it, how we develop it. It's still very challenging, like even hard models until today, we, as much as we could try, even with soft robotics, we're trying to build those valves and so on. But um, yeah, uh, that's where it is challenging for us to understand the whole biological system, because no matter how we study, it's not our comfortable zone. So we try to just uh, 
understand the first principles of um, those uh, uh, behaviors and we simulate them on the model. So that's why I thought uh, collaboration would be the best because then um, rather than do my naive research about biology, would have someone more specifically fully understanding um, those behaviors and then coming from the robotics would be definitely yeah. important. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you both. Uh, so now we have two questions and uh, I think I'm gonna go for the second one just because it's kind of a direct follow-up to what we're talking about. So the second uh, question is about, uh, could you populate the system with its own microbiome and study the effect? So I'll just clarify it for you, Raiman. I think the speaker, uh, the, the question is about uh, models of stomach could be used, uh, similar to like models of gut could be used for, as you mentioned, like testing systems. And one of the th interesting aspects of uh, research in microbiology now is all about like looking at the bacteria that live in our gut and our stomach and how their interactions and different behaviors affect our own behaviors and health. Uh, and the, the, the question is about like, could you sort of consider like this kind of system that you're designing, are they suitable for populating with bacteria of different class and then studying uh, their effects uh, on the sort of, um, uh, on the microbial community inside this system? Um, yeah, very good question. Thank you very much uh, again. Um, definitely, I've, I've definitely seen the trend of uh, the research and um, although I'm not fully related to that research, but it's definitely, it's interesting. And what, I'm, what the bigger picture of the robot, so the thing is, I still wanted to have a lot of testing. I want to test it, like it, it's been tested with liquids, for example, when tested with the juices and so on of the stomach, which is, it's not very, it's not a big problem because we have a silicon material and it's, it, it would work well with the acidity and so on. Um, so definitely that's uh, the bigger goal is if it's going to be for a test environment, it's definitely one of the, the, the bigger goal uh, for that. So as I, I mentioned, a few examples like food technology and uh, biomedical institute, uh, institutes that where they do all the EGG signals so on for controlling purposes. And uh, yeah, it's it, the, uh, the list would be go on and on if we actually have validated this is a proper uh, 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 robot that simulate the behavior. So I think it will be very helpful. Great. Now, so I'll go to the other question. So this question asks, how do you see an advancement in complex mechanical linkages and systems, uh, how those will impact soft robotics research? For instance, improved bistable mechanism or origami folding, etc. I think, I think I can probably answer that. Uh, I would say not much. So we, I think in software world, we are striving away from the idea of having uh, linkages and, and mechanisms. So we would like to have joints which are fully soft, right? And, and that means we, we don't rely on uh, mechanical link, linkages and, and, the, and so the design of complex mechanical linkages. Uh, but there is a certain area, a certain niche where you do use this. I think origami is a good example, which is somewhere in between soft robotics and traditional robotics, where the, where the dynamics is, is not very discrete, but it's also not continuous like in soft robots. Uh, they are modelable and there are some research using origami and uh, ma using mathematical models of origami to design, uh, for example, grippers, which has certain nice behaviors. But if, you, if you're going to fully soft, design we don't really rely on that those kind of uh, model based design uh, a lot of it is either bio inspired so we just cop or biometric just copies what we see in nature or based on human intuition uh, we don't have a better answer than that right at the moment maybe machine learning would in the future might figure out ways to design robots uh, but we don't know yet thanks thomas um Yes, yeah, so if anybody has any follow up on the questions, please feel free to post. I guess, Steph, you have some comment on this. Yeah, so I was wondering about um, the materials that you're using and the kind of the crossover with biomaterials as well, and whether there's any crossover happening now or, or in the future. Because that going back to the question about, you know, um, simulating the microbiome or stuff like that, I mean, Presumably, you'd have to have some sort of cell scaffold or or something like that. Um, is is there any work going on on that? 
uh, my, I'm, I'll go first and then Raimani can follow up. That's uh, yes, there are definitely a lot of examples of using biomaterials. Right? I, I did mention some of them. So there is purely like biohybrid system where you actually take biological materials like the muscles that I showed and put in robots. There's also work with a lot of work with hydrogels. Hydrogels are very interesting. Uh, we showed an example with uh, gelatin based uh, robots. These are also you know, biodegradable, uh, biocompatible, and also edible. So sometimes there, there are works on developing robots that you can eat and does something and then degrade inside the body itself. Uh, I can also, so there are also a lot of applications of biomaterials for sensing. Um, I'm familiar with some work from Sylvia Vignolini uh, from Cambridge, where she makes uh, uh, stress sensitive materials based on cellulose. So these, those kind of uh, materials have a lot of applications in, in software wordex. Uh, yes, uh, Ramon, would you like to add some more? Um, yeah, I was, I was just adding a little bit, which is that definitely um, material like soft robotics. There are, this is even for the title of soft robotics. So it was a lot of discussion about, do we call it soft robotics or material or this, because it's really heavily on material and the advances of material would advance the whole um, field. Um, and that's one of the thing. And the second thing is definitely, uh, as I said, uh, biomaterial definitely is very, very interesting. And especially for sensing, because uh, sensing is one of the biggest challenge um, in the soft robots. And we, we, having biomaterials, we could do a lot of things with them. Um, so the, the uh, for, for, for example, the, the example for the stomach, um, as we're using the silicon and so on at the moment, but um, it is very uh, important to move on to the actual uh, uh, the, the material that we actually could use for biological testing. Um, and that's, that's, that's definitely very possible to do. Um, um, yeah, that's, 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 where, that's where the importance of, I think, both uh, field would, would, be, would be nice to have, yeah. Simon, uh, I guess the next question is for Thomas. Um, um, the Thomas, you mentioned about uh, distributed intelligence is needed for soft robotics as opposed to central brain. Uh, and this, uh, the question is, could you please elaborate on this point, Pete? Right. I'm not sure if I ever I used the word intelligence. If I did, probably uh, that's my mistake. I'd, I'd rather not use the word intelligence, but I would agree that a distributed computation is probably required. So that's more or less the one of the big, basic principles of soft robotics. Right? You don't want to do com all the computation for doing a task inside your brain. It's, it's expensive because you need to transfer information from parts of your body to the brain. So any type, if you want to do uh, some computation for doing uh, for solving a problem, it's not necessary that all the information has to go to the central brain and then come out. It, it takes a lot of time and effort. So a lot of the time our body, uh, tries to solve some of the computational parts uh, locally. Uh, and that's kind of what you see when you're doing grasping with the soft body. So your body deforms to the object locally, which is can be considered as a sort of computation. Uh, in, in, if you look into the theory of computation, it, it perfectly fits. So it's, it's not against any theories of computation. And that helps doing these adaptations really quickly. So if you were to transfer this information to the brain and then adapt, that'll take way more time than being able to adapt locally using just the body itself. Yes, if that answers your question. I guess one question I had a bit more sort of what we face in synthetic biology, um, and I wonder whether similar sort of parallels are, are true in, in soft robotics. Like the field of synthetic biology basically started with studies on population. Uh, and it is much better, easier to control average level behavior. But then as we realize that we need sort of certain action, for example, autonomous performance of individual bacteria, we want every single bacteria that are, let's say, synthesized using the synthetic genetic circuits uh, to perform on its own and well. But when you do that, your population level performance declines because there are not interactions between the bacteria and that's very hard to design. Is that true also in soft robotics? Like, uh, uh, when you try to have interactions between different bacteria, uh, different robots, for example, I guess in the example that Ryman gave, uh, where you have these ring actuators, their interactions were built in. But you could imagine where independent soft robots have to communicate together and 
uh, is that easy to control their population level behavior? Um, it's it's definitely it's a very, very good question where we actually looking to what is it called is self organization. Um, so how to have multiple. Uh, let's say for robotics actuator or for you uh, cells or so on, how to control them. So we have, um, we could call it as under actuated system, for example, where you have a single input and you have multiple outputs. Um, we're trying to solve this, for example, we could have a, 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 some of the examples break of symmetry for, and how, uh, how we could uh, change the behavior of, uh, of a group by, changing either the frequency or some of the uh, applied input, uh, uh, some of the signals that we are applying by changing the parameters of those signals, we might have a different behavior. Um, there are a lot of works on that, but uh, it, it, uh, the ring, for example, I'm still looking how to make all the ring, as you said, uh, communicate between each other. So we have a better and smoother pre-steltic wave rather than having just uh, separate valves for each ring and communicate uh, separately. Um, it's, it's still, on, yeah, we 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 still going uh, doing this uh, research, and hopefully, I could find uh, uh, would say a simple answer to just uh, at least uh, simplify the whole control um, uh, the whole control rhythm for for a, a series of ring or a series of actuator in general. Very much. I guess there is there is no more question. Then maybe we can stop this session today. I guess what we learned sort of in terms of direct interaction between these two fields, I feel like the places where synthetic biology can contribute to soft robotics at the moment are biomaterials. Uh, and I think the places where sort of an approach of synthetic um, sort of soft robotics could come back to synthetic biology are testing environments that are more sort of uh, similar to biological systems. So rather than testing it like tanks, one could sort of imagine soft material based body parts like guts or heart, where we would like to test ourselves or other tissue engineering scaffolds. Uh, and the other area could be uh, sort of uh, testing principles, which of course would involve collaborations with biological uh, sort of experts with soft robotics people, where one could sort of test principles uh, through forward engineering of systems. I guess that's sort of my takeaway that are directly applicable. If you guys have other things, no, that was a great takeaway, actually. Thanks. <laughs> this, yes, right? I do agree with that as well. And um, and and really, thanks because uh, I mean, I know I know the field. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I sound really uh, naive in that. But I know the field exists, but it uh, never had the idea to actually uh, research and see what what is it about. And I just got surprised as how close it is. It's just. Um, from a different uh, point of view, basically, to going yeah. to the same direction on um, on how we can really understand the, the surroundings of us. With so uh, uh, maybe you guys going with really micro cells and so on, but we're looking for the bigger animal because that's what we could actually might could simulate at the moment. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you very much for. Yeah, for and the, I think like uh, the um, the. The open plan, especially Steph, Jim, they organized these sort of webinars that are really sort of uh, inspired by this idea to bring communities together, address practical challenges, and make each other aware of the other side. So feel yeah. free to like sort of jump in in the next round of webinars. Uh, I think Steph, if you just forward them, or maybe I'll forward them the emails about this. Steph, do you yeah. have anything to say at the end? Yeah. Uh, no, thank you um, both to the speakers and thank you, Shamanath, as well. And um, But otherwise, thank you all for coming and thank you for the wonderful talks and um, hopefully we'll see you all soon. Okay. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.